Thank you all. Uh, I should have just let Roseanne continue and be very quick on this part of the, the talk, which we hope comes up. Uh, the motivation for this study was that uh, in the orbiliomycetes, as you know yesterday from uh, uh, Hansado Baral's talk, one of the characteristic features is the spore body. And the spore body is unique among the Ascomycota. And because uh, by total accident, I've ended up with the Pisaizales and these studies in the orbiliomycetes, uh, I thought it would be interesting to look at the spore body and to be able to see whether we could find any homologies, uh, other structures that are like this. Uh, also, uh, to begin to think about what the, structure, what the function and the structure of this body is. And uh, I uh, have to say that I sacrificed a year of my life in high-level administration and was able to uh, get a postdoc from this, and I was lucky enough to have uh, Roseanne Healy come on, who is really a super person to do this kind of technical work. So uh, it's a conjunction of events that allowed us to be able to do this study. So uh, you heard a bit about spore bodies. Uh, uh, Baral's uh, photographs are much better than mine for the spore body of, at this level. Here's a cross-section of uh, one of the Orbilias. I'm not planning to talk about species here. We've sequenced all of the subjects of our uh, uh, examination here. We'll be able to go back and do uh, matching up. You know uh, from his talk that the spore bodies uh, stain in creasal blue, and you can pick these up fairly easily, and it is the, a primary characteristic for uh, organizing all of these what, 500 or so species that uh, are going to be described. We wanted to look at the histochemistry of this uh, initially to see whether we could tell what these were made of, so we did a couple tests here. Uh, and those tests are uh, in one case to look for polysaccharides and the other to look for proteins. And uh, on your left here, you'll see the, uh, the tests and here the controls. Uh, the uh, carbohydrates, of course, are very uh, frequent in the uh, fruit bodies. Here you get the proteins. Uh, you can barely see, but the spore bodies, or at least portions of the spore bodies, are stained with the Schiff reaction. So we know that part of the spore body is composed of carbohydrates. And uh, here you'll see this a, a little bit better uh, with the uh, spore bodies showing up, or a part of the spore bodies showing up and, and indicating that there's carbohydrates present. And we are hypothesizing at this point that these are glucans. Now, uh, this is uh, giving away the, uh, the show at the beginning. Uh, this is what this looks like when we do the uh, EM studies. And uh, here is a single spore primary and secondary walls. Here's the spore body, in this case with a neck and a membranous, you'll see later, kind of connection here. Uh, two zones, uh, we believe this is the, uh, the uh, carbohydrate zone, and this uh, seems to be packed with membranes. It's membrane bound, and you see that it's a little bit loppy in uh, its formation. Uh, this is the nucleus. So pretty striking. Now, uh, as I said, we sequenced all of the materials that we uh, studied, so we'll be able to go back and name and work with this. This is our tree based on GenBank uh, uh, accessions and our own sequences from local collections. Most of our collections are from the uh, Northeast. And I'll begin by talking about one of these clades, and this is leukostigma-like things and uh, so forth. Our subject here is an orbilia that we've designated as VR13. Uh, VR was uh, Valentina Rodriguez, who was an undergraduate student who uh, had been 
doing some work with us and did a senior thesis actually involving this topic. So what about the development in this species? This is the, the one that uh, we have the most information about at this point. So here we are with a, a spore. Primary wall is evident and you begin to see secondary wall development. Here is the earliest spore body that we've caught. And uh, this is, uh, has a membrane surrounding and you see it has arms and loops and so forth that are radiating from it. And here just uh, looking at this in different sections, different parts of a section, primary secondary wall and we think we find this spore body developing as the secondary wall develops or at the same time it develops. Uh, here's, the, the spore, here's the spore body, here's the spore body, and you see these, in some of these, these quite elaborate membrane folds here, and here is the, the neck region. Uh, and again, this close connection, here's primary wall, and then this, which you'll see later, is really stacks and uh, batches of membranes. Here's a little bit later on, and again, you can see this membrane structure. It's really quite fantastic here, surrounding the spore body, the neck, and then there's this darkened region at the junction here, primary, secondary wall. Okay, and here's a mature spore body again. This is what we end up with. Here's a closer view. And again, the, the wall layers are very distinct. Uh, this, again, membrane bound, this carbohydrate. And again, we're hypothesizing. Remember that word, it's a hypothesis. We don't know for sure yet, but we think that this is carbohydrate. And here are these membranes stacked and folded within uh, a neck region and a portion of the the spore body. And I know from looking at Hans Otto Baral's drawings, he's also seen these two zoned areas within the, the spore body. But now we can focus in and see a little bit about the structure here. And again, looking at the features, a uh, bigger view, this darkened area, membrane folds here membrane surrounds. Uh, this is a kind of tangential section and this gives you this neck region showing this in a tangential view. And again, these elaborate membrane systems surrounding these. So, what happens? The spores are there, they have this nice spore body. Uh, there's really been only one other study by Benny and Samuelson that discusses the uh, spore body and shows uh, electron micrographs of the spore body. Uh, they had various hypotheses about what happens with the spore body and what its function is. Does it float it? Does it stick it on? What does it do? Well, we began to look at these at uh, discharge. One of the points that I should have made early in the talk is uh, you need to realize how really small these ASCO spores are four or five uh, microns sometimes, very, very small spores. So uh, technically what uh, Baral has done is really quite fantastic because he's been looking at these spores and looking at these structures uh, uh, that we are uh, looking at here at very high magnifications. So the spores, these are deposited spores and uh, we're looking now at just at the point of germination here. And uh, here's a spore ungerminated. Here's one that's beginning to germinate. I, if any of you have ever grown these, one of the surprising things is that you have this itty bitty tiny tiny spore, it germinates and you get really pretty robust mycelia. And it's always been a kind of surprise to me. How do they do that? How does that happen? 
Well, I think we're beginning to understand a bit about what happens with it. Uh, this is a spore that is uh, germinating. And what you notice is that at this spore body end, there's been an expansion. So the spore has gotten really quite a bit bigger and wider. And here too. And uh, though it's not uh, always the case, the germ tube tends to originate from opposite the spore body. Uh, this is a cross-section of a spore. Here's the spore body. And it looks this way because you're sectioning it like this. Here's the spore body. And it's beginning to change a bit. Here we see it. Here we see it. But it, it's still there, and it's still, we can still uh, determine or look at it and see it. Uh, if we go a little bit later on, again, these, many of these have germinated, and uh, here's one, a lot of them here that have germinated here, and you begin to see that the spore body, uh, these are stained in creasal blue, you begin to see that that begins to dissipate, and what we see then in one of the spores here, germinating spore, uh, is that the uh, lighter portion, that, that is the uh, electron transparent portion, has largely disappeared. And we see a lot of activity here at this junction of the primary wall, secondary wall. And here's a lot of action. And uh, the membranes seem to be contributing to the expansion of the, the spore. And here it's just a tangential uh, through one of these, but it points out all of this membrane structure that's developing here. Uh, this I'll skip for the moment. Uh, further on in germination, the spore body more or less is, uh, is gone, but you see these uh, spores themselves have inflated quite greatly. And so our hypothesis, again, hypothesis is that the spore body is contributing to wall building at that point opposite the germ tube. And here's a bit more of it. Here's a germinated spore with the remnants of a spore body left behind. And then if we look carefully here, uh, secondary wall is more or less gone, or it's uh, uh, degenerating. We have a primary wall here. Uh, here's the remnants of the spore body, which we think is composed at this point still of carbohydrates. A lot of membrane activity here, that is here, and uh, those membranes contributing to the, the wall and the wall building. And uh, here's a bit more of it, whoops, mm -hmm. and a bit more of it. Uh, a lot of these spores and astomos when they're in culture and we uh, caught that, I won't say much more about that. Uh, one of the ideas was that the spore body had something to do with sticking down the spores on the surface. Uh, uh, in, when Roseanne was doing this, uh, she realized that it was very hard to stick the spores to a surface. And here you can see the floaters, and here you can see where they floated from as she was trying to fix these. Now, we did some comparative work with some other species. Here's leucostigma. This is an old photograph. It's from my MSA presidential address of 20 years ago. Uh, this is in this leucostigma group. We called it delicatula then, but leucostigma now. It looks like they're ornamented spores. If we begin to look at spore development in this uh, species, here's, uh, here's the spores. They can barely fit. They can barely fit within the ascus. They're just all tangled up in there. And uh, this shows very well the uh, formation of the primary of the walls and the development there. And uh, this wall development continues uh, in, uh, here's a spore. This is one spore. And if you think about that knobby uh, SEM, this is how it gets to be that way. Here they are, uh, not quite mature, but uh, forming a jigsaw puzzle within the ascus. And uh, here is the uh, 
again showing this kind of spore development with all of this loppy angled material. Here's the uh, mature ascus, mature spore with spore body. Here's the spore body, membrane stacks, so forth, membrane surrounded, and then this carbohydrate core. And again, finished these capitate paraphyses here, and here, here are the spores within the ascus. Uh, we went to another group. This is something kind of close to coccinella. Uh, looking at its development, I wanted to point out that young spores are very loppy and convoluted. Uh, they become uh, ovoid or uh, ellipsoid. Here they are. Here's the, the spore. Uh, so as a character, it may be that we have a developmental character within the ascus about the way the spores develop that uh, give us these knobby uh, looking spores. And here's just a bit more uh, of the development of the spore body. Here's the, the spore body and uh, same kind of uh, routine that we've seen. Here's our favorite, uh, or, uh, one of our favorites. It's a Roseanne collection. Uh, this has a, an elongate spore body. It's the same kind of structure in a way, a carbohydrate dense area and uh, membrane structure. Uh, here's in the luteo rubella clade, uh, and luteo rubella has again these long spores. Roseanne worked hard to get a spore that she could slice just right. Uh, but again, a similar kind of structure, this uh, carbohydrate core and a membrane area. Here's a venosa type, uh, again showing the early stages of development. And uh, here, uh, mature spore body, same kind of arrangement of membranes and core. And then, I was going fast because I wanted to get to this one, which is hyalorbilia. So uh, if we look at this, uh, it's about here onward. These are the nematode trappers, and that's what got me started in looking at these. Uh, and then there's everything else, and then there's hyalorbilia that is uh, being has been recognized as a distinct genus. And uh, there's some very good reason for that. Uh, here's a mature spore, here's a spore body, and here's a spore body. So two spore bodies within this. Uh, the spore body uh, is similar but has some uh, distinctive features. And here are two of them lined up, and these are these spores that have opposing spore bodies. But uh, what I wanted to point out that isn't really the subject of this, but something that we found out later on, as we looked at these, here's an ascus, here's one spore, two spores, and here is a structure. We don't know what it is. It's not membrane bound but it's in the tip of the ascus. It's consistently in the tip of the ascus in this genus. So, let me summarize. Spore bodies are membrane bound and associated with the plasma lemma. The contents, at least in part, are carbohydrates and we're hypothesizing that those are uh, glucans. Their function is likely in wall building and uh, we'll say that there's a striking difference between uh, the genus Hyalorbilia and Orbilia on the basis of the uh, spore bodies. And then uh, we have a number of people to thank. So thank you.